How many of you have heard of Rugged before? How many of you have seen a Rugged talk before? I know you have. All right. Okay. Okay, so usually I like to start with how I'm going to finish. Um, I think we're doing a terrible, terrible, terrible job on doing software. It doesn't mean that we aren't performing our jobs. It doesn't mean that we aren't um, successfully driving profits or creating new value. But we haven't really understood how important software is and how important your role as software architects and engineers have become. If you think about it, look up at the ceiling, right? None of us sat here in perpetual fear that this building was going to crush us, right? We have brick, we have steel, we have concrete. We take these things for granted because they're dependable, right? The bridges we walk over, the buildings you sleep in, you know, it's reliable infrastructure. The problem has become, and this is one of the founding principles behind Rugged, is that our dependence on software is becoming as great as our dependence on steel and concrete. But it's not nearly as reliable. In fact, I come from the hacker culture, and everything is hackable. Um, as long as someone has the means, motive, and opportunity, they can inflict harm on others who depend on that digital infrastructure. Now, the challenge is uh, we didn't used to have as much opportunity, but now that we're putting software into everything, well, we'll get to that. But what I like to do is instead of telling developers that they're lazy or irresponsible or they're putting everyone in danger, that's not a good strategy. Um, what I like to do, because I respect the software development culture, that's where I started. My, my first career was in software development 20 years ago. It's that we tend to think like things and in innovations like going from waterfall to agile or from agile to DevOps or DevOps to continuous delivery and continuous everything. And a lot of the things that we've taken, we took from other disciplines. So I'm a big fan of Deming. Edwards Deming revolutionized Toyota supply chain principles in the 40s in World War II Japan. One of the only things we haven't stolen from Deming is the actual supply chain bits. So I'm going to assert that if we steal some of these supply chain principles and put them in a modern software development, not only will you have less unplanned, unscheduled work, not only will you be on time on budget, not only will your operations people have fewer break fixes, but you'll also have a faster mean time to identify and repair. And if I can appeal to the things that you're already measured on and bonused on and incentivized on, and it happens to also make digital infrastructure safer, that's a really good thing. So this isn't so much a security talk, but for the first time in history, I think doing the safe thing happens to also be doing the profitable thing. So I'm going to demonstrate some of those principles in action. And because this is a developer conference, I want to show some really sexy data and a data visualization. So I'm going to quickly go to that. Um, I have to clarify my title. So I am Josh Corman. I'm one of the founders of the Rugged Software Movement and authors of the Rugged Software Manifesto, as well as the uh, I Am the Cavalry Movement. But between accept getting accepted here and today, I actually left the private sector. So I quit my job as the CTO of Sonatype. I'm actually on sabbatical. And I'm now at an international policy think tank focused on cyber safety, at least um, for the foreseeable future until we can get some sanity wrapped around cars and medical devices. So I am still an advisor to Sonatype, but I'm not here representing any commercial interest. And I love zombies, by the way. Um, one of the things I like to start with is why do you do what you do? So whether you're at a hacker con or developer conference, there's something that motivates you as a person. And what I realized way too late after 10 years of trying to tell developers how to do security better is that any strategy that makes me have to change what you care about is a strategy that's going to fail. Right? People care about what they care about, and I need to meet them and, and embrace them there. I wake up every day, and I want to make the world a safer place. I'm a protector. Some of my hacker friends are not protectors. They're puzzlers. They want to figure out hard problems. Some of them want to become famous, so it's about prestige. So I really don't know what motivates you, but something made you choose to get into software. Something makes you choose to stay at the job that you're at. So whatever it is that motivates you, I hope that there's something in here that can help you do a better job at what you already care about. 
So if you don't know this guy and you haven't read The Phoenix Project, this is Gene Kim. He's one of my brothers from another mother, I guess. And when he comes from the security industry, um, he was the inventor of Tripwire, which is a really, really important tool for change management in servers and for system integrity. But he kind of gave up on security because what he realized is we're working really, really, really hard to secure things, but the things we're trying to secure cannot be defended. They're indefensible. And one of the things he was attracted to was IT performance. And he did this really amazing study called Visible Ops that looked at the top performing IT companies in the world and figured out what made them good at their jobs. But the next thing he stumbled across was this DevOps stuff. And when he started explaining it to me, I started having heart palpitations. Because I said, this is terrible. Like, we can't even secure an agile environment. It moves too quickly. How are we ever going to do this with DevOps? So we kind of put our heads together, and we said that secure, DevOps was really the end of security as we know it. Because there's really no way with those cycle times to really do a lot of the things that we used to do. But you know, I stopped for a second. I said, well, maybe that's a good thing. And I, I don't, I'm going to apologize to my OWASP brother in the room. But you know, I looked at things, and I said, you know, we do a really terrible job at application security. So why are we trying to fight to the death to maintain something that doesn't work very well? We have a lot of good technology, and we have a lot of good tools, and a lot of them are free, and we have a lot of training. But the adoption has been very, very poor. So I said, maybe it's not a bad thing. That's the end of security as we know it. And we said, you know, let's try to, instead of being afraid of DevOps, let's look for the common ground we might have. Now, security people have a pretty terrible attitude. This is how we view uh, DevOps. I'm not the one that made this slide, but I, I do love it in some ways. We, we tend to inherit everything that happened before us in the SDL. And we try to clean up the mess after. But that's really not the best attitude. So what we realized is we were going to need a bigger boat. And we weren't going to be able to do this with just Gene and I putting our heads together. If you haven't read his Phoenix Project, it's essentially the Bible for DevOps. So we started growing the tribe. And if you recognize this guy, it's uh, Jez Humble, uh, one of the co-authors of Continuous Delivery um, and the Lean Enterprise. And we started meeting people like John Willis from Docker and the guys that run DevOps Days. And we said, let's take the best and brightest from the DevOps tribe and the best and brightest from the security tribe that have good attitudes. Let's find some way to have some collaboration together. Um, and he still doesn't know what he got into. But we, we basically started merging these tribes. And we've been running these rugged DevOps Days or rugged DevOps tracks at various conferences for free because we do think there's a natural uh, fit for us to work together. Now, Who's heard the Mark Andreessen quote that software is eating the world, right? And what he basically means is everyone's becoming a software company. As a hacker, I can't help but think it's infecting the world, right? We're putting software in everything. When I see software, I know there's a defect rate per thousand lines of code. And because of that, every piece of software you add is making that product weaker. Now, clearly, you don't look at it that way. We love the idea we're going to have hyper-connected cars. And we love the idea that the Internet of Things coming into our home adds convenience. But I want you to think of it as well that when you add software to something, you make it hackable. There is no human that can write unhackable code. The more code you have, the more problems. So it's more of a trade-off. And I started thinking about the best metaphor for this. This still isn't the best metaphor. But metal, when you galvanize steel, you're making it rust-proof so you can use it outdoors. But what happens is the act of making it galvanized, which is a benefit, right? rust proof is a benefit, makes it brittle. So these things tend to break more easily or bend more easily. And I, I think at some point we're going to look at software that way and connectivity that way, that when we get the benefits we want and we can accept the trade-offs, we do it. And when the trade-offs are unacceptable, we don't do it. But we're not mature enough yet. In fact, I sometimes call the Internet of Things like asbestos or cyber asbestos. Right? It was fire retardant. It was lightweight. You were an idiot not to make buildings like this using asbestos. But then we noticed it was causing massive amounts of cancer and it was very expensive cleanup. And we had to condemn buildings because we were using that material in an unsafe way. So I start thinking about building materials, and then I look about things like Heartbleed. Every single one of you were affected by Heartbleed. Some of you, just in your social media accounts or your banking, you had to roll your passwords again, maybe. Or maybe if you're in charge of a site, you had to you know, redo all your, your keys. But if you're a programmer, for this, this wasn't a security issue for you. This was unplanned, unscheduled work. Right? You had to stop what you were doing. You had to be late for your commitment to your stand-up or your sprint. And you had to do rework. Now, one of the things that bothered me about Heartbleed was that I think it was a real wake-up call for people. We have this long-standing belief that open source is more secure 
than closed source, and it's mostly a, a religious belief. And the truth is that while there may be many eyeballs to notice all bugs, and all bugs will be shallow, it's, apparently no one was looking, right? So either they weren't incentivized eyeballs, they weren't qualified eyeballs, but people really weren't looking at these core libraries like OpenSSL, OpenSSH, NTP, some of the really foundational bits. And as soon as one little bug was found, what people got very little talk about is there were 31 other CVEs in that calendar year. So a little drop of blood in the water and all the sharks circle, and what we're finding is there's tons and tons and tons of remotely exploitable flaws in a lot of these core libraries. But the other thing that we found is that only about half of them got patched. So in the first month, about 50% of the internet exposed OpenSSL got patched. It was pretty quick. But the last long tail didn't get patched. And in fact, the number is climbing of unpatched systems because new embedded systems are, are shipping with the old OpenSSL library. So the, the population of exposed nodes is growing. It's over 600,000 last time I checked with Rob Graham. But it's, when we look at which systems aren't being patched, a lot of them are in embedded in IoT devices or industrial control systems. So Siemens industrial control systems, like the ones that Stuxnet attacked, they were good because they admitted they were vulnerable and they could issue a patch to their customers. But a lot of their competitors were also vulnerable and couldn't be patched. So if you're not in embedded systems or cyber physical systems, maybe this isn't important to you. But what you should start realizing is as we add software to your cars and your medical devices and your electric power plants, we're not writing brand new software for that. We're taking mostly open source code and moving it over. So if those things are both exposed and unpatchable, that's a fairly terrifying thing. And if it's not Heartbleed, it's going to be Bash Bug or Shell Shock or Apache Commons collections. If you saw the hospital ransomware that took out patient care in California, um, it was just a standard piece of crimeware, but they had to move patients from one hospital to another. Imagine going to the, in the ambulance and you're bleeding and you're told you have to go to another hospital because there's a piece of ransomware. That was a flaw in JBoss. It was a known flaw in JBoss that nobody knew about or patched. So I started thinking about this in terms of your life, and the best analogy, and then I'll shift to the rugged and the software supply chains, is you guys remember the Haitian earthquake? The earthquake in Haiti killed 270,000 people. It was very devastating, and there was lots of humanitarian relief. Actually, 230,000 people. It was a 7.0 Richter scale earthquake. And six weeks later, that got almost no coverage, no news, no fanfare. It was a much, much stronger earthquake in Chile. It killed 279 people. So you have a 7.0 Richter scale killing 230,000 people, and an 8.8 .8 Richter scale only killing 279 people. So when all this, the scientists and the, and the seismologists and everyone looked at why the heck were there so many fewer deaths with such a bigger earthquake, there was a lot of factors involved, but the number one contributor was building codes. Chile had modern building codes. Haiti didn't. So the earthquakes that shook the buildings in Chile flattened the buildings in Haiti. And one of the guys in the US government said, well, we don't have building codes for building code. And I don't want to start licensing each of you, but we really don't hold ourselves to any sort of standard when we're placing lives and public safety on software foundations. So many, many years ago, I wrote the Rugged Software Manifesto before I was even really concerned about the Internet of Things. I don't think we were even using that phrase, but I'm going to read two lines from it. One's for the security people and one's for the, the developer people. So one of the things we wanted to instill, almost think of this as a Hippocratic oath for your profession, is I recognize my, my code will be attacked by talented and persistent adversaries who threaten our physical, economic, and national security. The ones that developers like is right before that. I recognize my code will be used in ways I cannot anticipate, in ways it was not designed, and for longer than ever intended. In fact, if you think about the guy who introduced the heart bleed flaw, um, there's two lessons. Um, one is I hear, I, I would love to meet the guy, but I hear he's like massively depressed now because he knows that his one code commit caused significant damage and, um, and pain. In fact, I really feel bad for the developer whose code causes the first fatality. You know, I don't want to scare people away from doing the profession. If you're a good programmer, I want you to stay in. I just want you to realize that depending on what you're doing, your, your code may be used in a place that you had never thought of before. But the other lesson is that it looks like the commit was at like four in the morning on New Year's Day. So I like to say that friends don't let friends drink and code. 
Um, so one of the things that is a natural extension of the, of the rugged software manifesto, if that was trying to inspire that maybe the things you're doing matter more than you realized, um, is now that things are becoming more intense, we started a different group recognizing that no one's going to come save us on issues of public safety. If the cavalry isn't coming, then you're the cavalry. So the, the I am the cavalry was a personal commitment each of you can made, and I just stuck this slide in here um, because of this morning's keynote, but we've been working for a few years now, about three, uh, in fact, DEF CON will be our third birthday. On our first birthday, we published a five-star cyber safety framework for connected vehicles. And we're trying to take the best researchers and the best programmers and make sure that they work at these car companies or with these car companies so that since all systems fail, we want to be prepared for failure. So in a different day, in a different place, we can dive into that. But in general, to tie this off, if all systems fail, and the keynote speaker alluded to this, we want you to be ready for failure. So when I'm explaining this to my neighbor, basically tell your customers how you avoid failure, tell researchers you won't sue them if they help you avoid failure, how do you capture, study, and learn from failure, we're very poorly instrumented, how do you have a prompt and agile response to failure, and how you contain and isolate failure. So the fact that the Jeep Cherokee was hacked last summer by Chris and Charlie isn't the issue. The fact that it could also shut off the brakes or, or kill the engine on the highway is the issue. So we have very poor preparedness for failure. And since you're going to be writing the, inf the digital infrastructure that goes into the next car I drive, I wanted you to know the responsibility you have. But back to rugged DevOps, OK? So anybody in here self-identify as a security guy? I don't see any hoodies, so there must be no hackers, because only hackers wear hoodies, right? OK, there's one. Um, I think there's a tremendous amount of common ground. And without getting it, there's an entirely different presentation here. But there's five things I want you to think of that we have tons of common ground between the security profession and the developer and DevOps profession. I think number one is that um, we, we like to instrument everything. So the fact that DevOps is about measuring anything and everything gives tremendous visibility and actionable telemetry information for machine learning. Uh, when I was at Occam, I was the director of security intelligence, and the fact that we could have the instrumentation of the fan speed on a server or the CPU temperature meant that if we saw a slight spike, 5% change in fan speed, we assumed we were compromised, and we can use that as an actionable security event. So I think the fact that the instrumentation instinct is there for DevOps is really good for security. Number two, um, we like to be mean to our code. So the invention and the, the, the precedent of things like Chaos Monkey and the Simeon Army from Netflix, the idea that you want to be tested, Jez has this great line that the only way to avoid failure is to fail all the time, or if it hurts, do it a lot, right? I think actually the first one came from Netflix. And the idea there is creates room for things like Gauntlet and Breakman and a lot of the security tools that we've been building to do automated unit tests to, to tighten feedback loops and give you guys response the second you introduce failure instead of three months later after you've moved on. The third one is we both hate complexity. Right? Complexity is the enemy of stability. It's the enemy of availability. It's the, and it's the enemy of security. The fourth one is we have uh, accidental change management, which is really, really good for security. As, as you use automation and orchestration tools like Chef and Puppet and Rundeck and Ansible and whatnot, you end up with really good rigorous change in audit logs, which is excellent for security. So all the people in the security that think that they're cleaning up the, the unicorn poop are forgetting these amazing things. And the last one is I just think the attitude of DevOps is about empathy and tearing down walls. And what I've noticed is if a, a new group can give something to the DevOps community, such as software supply chain hygiene, which I'm about to show, uh, they'll get back in spades because the developers will say, how can I make your job easier? You just made my job easier. How can I also make yours easier? So back to the complexity point, this is a wiring uh, job. I don't know. I hope it's not too dark. Um, and we talk about technical debt all the time, but there's also security debt, which grows at the same rate. And the idea is that technical get debt gets worse over time. And we've gotten to the point where our systems are so complex that we can't even debug them anymore. The reason I like the microservices track and the trend yesterday is we're taking these big monolithic software objects that we can't debug or secure, and we're making them smaller and more manageable. OK. Oh, my battery's not dead. OK. But complexity is really killing the software industry. This is a, a graphical representation of Maven Central. So at Sonotype, I was the custodian of the largest open source repository in the world. So whether you know about Sonotype or not, if you've ever done anything with Java, you're grabbing stuff from Maven Central. 
and the dependencies and the dependencies on top of dependencies and the transit of dependencies is a mess. The, the number of pieces of code you have to pull in for the most basic little function is getting to be insane. So at some point, that complexity, even though we're getting lots of free code and lots of really good functionality and we don't have to reinvent the wheel, at some point we buckle under the weight of our own complexity. Well, this same kind of thing happened in, in manufacturing a long, long time ago. So most of the modern software principles you get came from this guy. This is Edwards Deming. He tried to go to, to, to Detroit, to the automotive industry, and the US ignored him. So he went to Japan after World War II. He said, if you follow my lead, I will make you a prosperous nation and a profitable economy in five years. So he went to Toyota, which we now know as a car company, but at the time it was a textiles manufacturer. And he turned them in the most successful and most profitable car company in the world, and they had a dominant lead for 30 years before anybody else figured out how to copy it. So for him, he just said, look, we've got to find better ways to manage complexity. There's lots of things he did. But if you think about those motivations I hinted at earlier, most developers, they want to be on time, on budget, with acceptable quality and risk, probably in that order, right? And what do we do? In the beginning, we started with waterfall, and that's where I started. If I couldn't get a bug fixed, it was going to be two years before I got another chance to get a bug fixed. Then we went to Agile, and there's nothing more Agile than goats, apparently. Um, and Agile really compressed the dev time and the test time uh, and made it more iterative, and it, it made us faster, but not necessarily higher quality. So if you look at Agile and continuous integration against those three motivations, you did a really good job at being on time. Now, some people say that DevOps was really Agile for everybody else. Everyone has a different definition for DevOps. So it really extended the promise of Agile with continuous delivery, and now you had um, Agile with Ops, and you had on time, on budget. But what we haven't been paying attention to is in our speed and our race to do this, we've introduced significant complexity. We're having a lot more break fixes, a lot more service interruptions, a lot more unplanned, unscheduled work. And if you're a fan of lean and the eight types of waste, we've essentially added a ninth kind of waste in Muda, which is um, the unplanned and unscheduled work that comes with too much complexity in our software supply chain. So if you want to take a fuller embrace of Deming, we go to Toyota Supply Chains. And he revolutionized the way that you do this with a couple key principles. And the, the theory here is if we add software supply chains or rugged DevOps, we can go faster beyond time on budget with acceptable quality and risk. So here's two different hybrid cars. So he showed some Teslas the other day. I want to see how the Tesla does their parts. But when the electric cars first came out, you had the Toyota Prius and you had the Chevy Volt. The Toyota one costs significantly less so it was 61% of the cost. They sold 23,000 units instead of 1,700. So they sold way more. They, sh they made uh, only 27% of their own car versus Chevy had to make more than half of their own car. And you would think that if they made less of their own car, they must have relied on more suppliers, right? But it was actually the exact opposite. They made 27% of their car with only 125 suppliers. Chevy did significantly more. So with far fewer suppliers, they made 10 times better use out of each of them. And what happened was they just dominated the competition, and their price point was lower, their quality was higher, the, you know, the Chevy Volt was plagued with issues, including batteries catching on fire, which is yet another mistake in a supply chain. So when you study these things, you basically get three principles, and they're going to come up in my data visualization. Number one, you want to use fewer and better suppliers. So you don't pick every logging framework in the world. You pick one or two. And you don't pick every airbag company for your car. You pick a proven high-quality airbag company. Then you use the highest quality parts from that manufacturer. So don't pick a five-year-old vulnerable version of Log4j. Pick the least vulnerable version. In the car metaphor, you don't pick the bad batch of Takata airbags that was defective. You would go to jail if you used a bad version or a bad batch. You want to use the, the, the freshest of ingredients. And then lastly, trace which part went where throughout manufacturing so that when there is a new recall, you don't have to get a recall for every single car in your fleet so you'd go out of business. You just call the people who got the bad batch. So tracking which version of the airbag went into which vehicle allows for a prompt and agile and efficient response. In software terms, if you've got 3,000 applications and you don't know which ones are using which version of OpenSSL, 
when there's a heart bleed attack, you have to test every single one of them or hope. If you have traced which parts went where, it's really best practices for manufacturing. Okay. How's my time? I got a late start. Okay. Someone give me some hand signals. So when you look at our dependence on open source, I'm not actually complaining about this. We've gotten so much more done because we don't have to write our own logging framework or our own authentication library or our own crypto. We're able to use really good free and available stuff. So we ended in 2014 with 17 billion. I think we ended 2015 with a 31 billion unique downloads from Maven Central. And I had a unique purview into that consumption. But the challenge wasn't so much that we used open source, it's that the attackers noticed. So it used to be that if I wanted to find a flaw in one bank, you know, AB and AMRO, I want to find a flaw in their bank website, I would do some reconnaissance, I'd find a bug, and I would attack AB and AMRO. Not me personally, of course. But now what I figured out is, wait a second, they're all using struts too. So if I attack a flaw in Apache struts too, I get every bank, right? So it really is an amplification. With that shared dependence comes a shared attack surface. And it amplifies the return on my investment, so to speak. So one flaw can have a massive impact. In fact, it's worse than that, because when I know I actually can attack a bank that's using Apache Struts 2, even if they patch it, I know that if I find another bug in Apache Struts 2, I can go back to that bank over and over and over, because it's unlikely you're going to rip that out. So that dependency comes with the risks and trade-offs. In fact, it was exactly that project that took down nearly every bank when I was at Akamai. In fact, this is one of the reasons I decided to go into the software supply chain business was I was trying to protect them from anonymous DDoS attacks or from Syrian Electronic Army or from SQL injection and cross-site scripting and many of the things you see in the OWASP top 10. But I wasn't paying attention to the fact that almost all the attacks were now against known flaws in open source libraries that everyone was using. So I really think that's when things changed. In fact, I said to myself, why are they starting to target OpenSSL? Or oh, in this case, Apache Struts 2. So I mapped every single known vulnerability for the CVSS score from 1 to 10 across the history of the Struts project. And this one was the bad one. And that particular bug had been there for 11 years. So no one was looking back to that many eyeballs fallacy. But what you can tell is that the number of flaws and the severity of flaws are growing up into the left, up into the right. And that's not good. So it's open season on open source. The one that really bugs me, and most of you are using this even if you don't know you are, is Bouncy Castle is a cryptography library, right? It's actually called the Legion of the Bouncy Castle Cryptography APIs for Java, but we'll just call it Bouncy Castle. Um, in 2007, it had a known full remote code execution flaw. It's a security project written by security professionals for security use cases. They care a ton about security. They don't need the rugged manifesto. They deeply care about security. But everybody has a bad day because all software has flaws. There's a certain defect rate per 1,000 lines of code. There's a lot of code in there. So they fixed it right away. They issued an update. And in spite of them having an update immediately in 2007, we kept looking at who's still using the vulnerable version. And it was thousands and thousands of organizations. There were 4,000 unique companies that downloaded it 20,000 times and put it into 650,000 applications, some of which you're using right now on your iPhone or on your Android. So these are really terrible, avoidable mistakes. Right? And the same, same thing for HTTP client, et cetera. And these things are making their way into cars, and they can't be patched. So some of the remote interfaces into these vehicles are using known flaws in really old versions of libraries. And even if they wanted to fix them, they can't. So I'm a little less concerned about the math being wrong with the Greek letters from the keynote, and a lot more concerned about someone using a 10-year-old known vulnerability to hurt you and your family. So as we consume these parts from the cloud, we aren't really filtering out the bad stuff. What we see is 75% of the stuff downloaded had a known vulnerability in it. When you put it in your Nexus or your Artifactory, we saw that um, when you do your automated builds with Jenkins and other things, a lot of bugs were getting into there. And I'm going to actually just skip this because I'm going to show you a data visualization instead. Okay. Who likes slides when you can do data? Okay. Come on. I hope you can read this. All right, so back to that claim that software is eating the world. So here's a piece of software, right? Big green piece of software eating the world. The problem is we don't write software anymore, right? We assemble it from third party and open source. Somebody be bold and tell me how many pieces of open source you think are in a modern piece of software. 
Anybody? Come on, Martin. Oh, someone says 100. Good guess. Um, so here's 100 pieces. Most people guess 50. And the truth is you probably picked 50. But the software you pick picks other stuff, right? There's transitive dependencies. So the average is actually 106. We studied thousands and thousands of, of, uh, in the first ever state of the software supply chain report last year. The new one's about to come out. So there's 106 unique open source projects of varying size in your code. Now, if it's a mobile app, it's going to be less. If it's a big application, it's going to be more. But that's a lot of software bits and parts, right? So back to the supply chain idea from Deming. We have a supply chain. We just don't manage it like one. Now, who thinks that they're all green and healthy, right? There was a guy at Microsoft who once said that uh, um, software ages like milk, not like wine, right? It gets bad pretty quickly. So it turns out that 23% as a ratio have some sort of known vulnerability in them. And who cares about security if you just want to be on time on budget? But I'm going to frame this in terms of the impact it has on software development teams. So some of them will be low, medium, and high. They're not all super serious ones like shell shock. But in there, about a quarter of the parts that you're using have avoidable risks in them that will cause unplanned, unscheduled work. You'll have to stop what you're doing go back to an old project, download the new version, do another Jenkins build, do another unit test, push it to production, then you can get back to what you're doing. So no one wants to do that. And if it was bad the day you chose it, that's, a, that's completely avoidable. So without paying attention to hygiene, about a quarter of the, 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 um, the components we have have a known vulnerability. And this might be harder to see, but we don't have to just fear evil hackers. We also have to fear evil lawyers. So these little purple rings, it's 8% of the ones we chose are being used against their license. So it's illegal to use it. And you will open your company to lawsuit. I try to like, explain to people, why is this, they say, well, why is this a big deal? No one's going to sue us. I used to do acquisitions for IBM. And if you look at how much money Nest made when Google bought them, I think, what was it, $4 billion US. If they had had bad licenses in their software base, they would not have been bought. right? It, depending on how serious the licenses are. So sometimes just accidentally using a copy left or an AGPL can get you sued, like uh, Cisco got sued when they bought Linksys, or it could get you to be not acquired if you're trying to have a good exit. So this is the average hygiene of a normal application. And when you think about this, this isn't that big of a deal, because not every single flaw is going to get you hacked, right? But if you go down to the bottom here, if I can see, what I'm basically saying is if only 10% of these in a given year hurt you, and it takes maybe 100 bucks an hour for your, your payroll, and it takes you 10 hours to stop what you're doing, go grab the new version, do another build, get back on track. These are pretty conservative estimates. But what you end up with is with those really conservative estimates, that one application is going to cost you 30 hours of downtime, and it's going to cost you um, $3,000 of wasted payroll. And you're going to say, well, Josh, who cares about that? That's not that much. But this is the base model. And when you go to scale it, come on. No one's working on a single application. You're probably touching 10. And the team you're on is touching 100. And when you get to simply even just 100 of these things, you're now up to a quarter of a million in waste just for using something that was bad the day you chose it. Completely avoidable. And 10% is a really modest estimate. Most of you last year had to fix at least OpenSSL, at least Shellshock, at least Apache Commons collections, at least JBoss, maybe plural times for each of those projects because the attackers are doing it more. So three is all it takes to get to these numbers, three per application. So to me, this is a massive waste of our time and effort. And this is something that starts to get to your boss's attention. Now, even if you don't like those numbers, once you start getting into real sizes, like I work with some of the Fortune 50 companies, they have 6,500 applications. That's 17, 000, 17 million US dollars of wasted development time. That's serious money. So I don't convince them to do better software supply chains because they want to make you know, safer code. I convince them to do software supply chains because they like money, right? So my, my assertion, I'm going to jump back into the slides here. My assertion is that if you use fewer and better suppliers, higher quality parts, and you track which parts go where, you'll end up with material reduction in unplanned, unscheduled work, 
for developers. You'll end up with fewer break fixes for operations who are measured on five nines of availability and fast MTTR or mean time to repair or recover. And you'll end up having significantly reduced attack surface as well. And that's not about having to learn how cross-site request forgery works, which is also important. It's really about just use the freshest of ingredients. We had one uh, government website using 11 different logging frameworks in the same website. So if you heard on the news tomorrow that there's an a, a exploitable attack in a logging framework, you could say, well, there's only 20 of those. I have a 1 in 20 chance of getting hit. But if you're using 11 of them, um, you just upped your odds of being hit. So when I started looking at the open source hygiene itself, and I'll just make this point very briefly. You can read this if you want more data. We said, how good are the open source projects at fixing their flaws? Because this is you know, software on top of software on top of software. And when we looked at all of the Java projects in Maven Central, what we found is when they have a CVE or known vulnerability in one of their direct dependencies, they only fix them 41% of the time, ever. I asked two questions. How often do they fix them? And how quickly do they fix them, MTTR? So they only fix about less than half of the security vulnerability. So even if you're keeping current on their version, it still has less than half of its bugs fixed. And when they do fix it, it was 390 days on average, so over a calendar year. It took about uh, a few hours for some of these known CVEs to start getting exploited worldwide. And the best response that some of these guys do is over a calendar year. And on top of that, if you're not even taking those fixes like Bouncy Castle from 2007, no wonder we have indefensible infrastructure. And no wonder I'm so worried about my car and my medical devices and my hospitals. And to remind you, the hospital that had to shut down patient care was because of one known flaw in JBoss in one library. Just one. And it was essentially the same serializer, deserializer problem as you saw with Apache Commons collections from Foxglove. So I would say we have a public health issue. I tried to be a little generous and say maybe they fix the level 10s faster, and they do. It's 224 days, not much better. Now, to, that's the overall population. If you look at individual projects, some of these projects care deeply about security, so they fix most of their bugs, and they fix them within 90 days or so. But the next time you go to pick a logging framework, wouldn't you like to know the percentage of bugs they fix, how quickly they fix them, how much they care about security? Because if you think the functionality is basically equal, but one has amazing hygiene and one has terrible hygiene, this is a pretty easy fix for us to incorporate into our profession. And if we did so, we'd start massively reducing uh, unplanned work and risk. OK, so I'm going to skip this, especially because no one here cares about US Congress things, other than to say that there's action going on in different parts of the regulatory, uh, private sector, and public sector. And the idea was there's actually a push to do something called the cyber supply chain transparency. And the idea is will corporations or people who produce software and goods start publishing a list of ingredients, just like there is on food. So um, the idea was anything sold to the US government in this particular case, but many of your governments have been meeting with, in fact, in the last 48 hours, um, to say, you must provide a software bill of materials of the third party and open source libraries you used in a machine readable fashion. Uh, number two, that list should not have any known security vulnerabilities or CVEs in the national vulnerability database. And number three, because future vulnerabilities are going to happen, if you have a product that is not patchable, we don't want to buy it anymore. So tell us the ingredients. They cannot be known defective without a good reason, and they must be patchable. And those three things are starting to show up elsewhere. All the big banks globally through the financial services ISAC have put that into standard procurement language, at least bullet number one. They want a machine-readable software bill of materials from all their software providers. And then they're going to cross-reference that for vulnerability state at any given time. So they, they ignored the last two. Underwriters Laboratories has very recently, in the last two months, put out a cyber assurance program certification for medical devices and industrial controls devices and they require a bill of materials, no known defects without a mitigation strategy, you must be patchable, and they add a few more. You must do a static analysis, you must do a pen test, and you must do fuzzing. So if you do those six things, you can get the underwriter's laboratory seal. You're also seeing big auditor 
uh, firms globally start to ask, maybe this is the definition of due care. So if a company is hacked or a piece of software is hacked because of a known vulnerability, that's negligence. But if there is an exotic zero day from China, that's fine. You know, no one could blame you for that. So you're starting to put these things in a context. And if you go back to my Bouncy Castle case, which is where we'll end, if those 4,000 organizations had to provide a software bill of materials and certify there were no known vulnerabilities, every single one of them would have said, oh, there's a level 10 flaw in this Bouncy Castle library. Is there an alternative one? And they would see that, yes, it's been fixed for seven years. Actually, at this point, it's nine years. Um, and they would take the alternative one, which is stable, API consistent, builds well, and they'll move on. And this is how we'll start to drain the swamp. So I want to leave you with this idea that uh, these two little words of known vulnerabilities, not only is it the right thing to do for safety uh, and the right thing to do for security, it's also the right thing to do for unplanned, unscheduled work, for the, the, the break fixes. And uh, this is a one-year-old report, but Verizon does the annual report on how people are being hacked and compromised, mostly for credit cards and banks. They made this chart uh, with a data scientist. They said, if you look at all of the successful exploits in the previous year, they tracked to just 10 known CVEs, 10 known vulnerabilities. So 97% of the attacks. Now, there's been some dispute over this stat, but the general rule holds. So 97%, not 80-20 rule, like the keynote said, 10 flaws constituted 97% of the global attacks. And when you look at the ages of those flaws, eight of them had had a patch available for more than a decade. So while I care about exotic attackers and sophisticated attackers, while I, while I am concerned about nation states, while I am concerned about the OWASP top 10, I think this is a very, very solvable problem. Use the freshest of ingredients from the known suppliers you're using. And it would have an incredibly huge impact on how systems are actually being compromised right now. So back to the Deming thing of working smarter, not harder. OK, so I got a late start. I'm just going to wrap up by reminding us, I think it's very easy to take a slightly fuller embrace of Deming, use fewer and better open source projects, use the highest quality parts from those open source projects, and track where they go. The benefits essentially will be less unplanned, unscheduled work, faster mean time to repair when things do go wrong, et cetera. And what we've been measuring, at least in the last year and a half of this experiment, is that the organizations that did this got a 30% boost in developer productivity just by trying their first year. And uh, don't take my word for it on the hygiene. Just take a free health check from either AppScan or what's the one, dependency checker, or there's a free health check from the Sonatype booth. Whatever you're going to look for, find out what your hygiene is, and you might be able to save yourself significant uh, wasted time. And this isn't just about your day job, right? It's up to us whether our big cyber earthquakes, right? It's not the presence of the earthquake or the magnitude of the earthquake. It was, were we ready for it with sufficient building materials and sufficient building codes? So you get to choose if we're going to be more like Haiti or more like Chile. And I hope the answer is clear. So I don't know how you're motivated, but I uh, hope at least after this initial chunk of the rugged DevOps track with great content to follow that you are motivated. So thank you for your time. <coughs> OK, super. Um, are there any? tools available that I can use to cross-reference my dependencies against the CVE reports? Yeah, there's a number of commercial and free ones. So I, I just accidentally mentioned some. There's a free project from OWASP called uh, Dependency Checker. There are commercial tools from uh, Black Duck, from Sonatype, from um, there's a little bit of one in Veracode. It's like um, mostly to respond to customer pressure. Uh, Synopsis slash Konamicon has one and um, source clear. So there's a, there's a growing number of folks that will look at fingerprinting the open source you're using and to varying levels of quality uh, due to dependency mapping. Um, there's a free one from Sonatype called uh, App Health Check. So that's free. Uh, but if you want to do it at scale, you usually have to end up doing some sort of commercial solution. But to get an idea of your hygiene, don't pay a penny from anybody. Just There's plenty of free ways to get a snapshot of your, of your hygiene. OK. Um, if everyone is using proven libraries or versions of libraries, uh, does this not stifle innovation and the development of new libraries? 
Um, I think your overall economics of your choice is um, for certain use cases where public safety or human life are there, we should hold ourselves to incredibly high quality, high assurance, um, high security libraries. And that's going to favor smaller, less complex ones. And one of, the, one of my favorite things that happened after OpenSSL was you saw Libre SSL, Boring SSLs, S to N, a series of alternative libraries that are smaller. Because then when you really look at the OpenSSL project, it's way too big to ever fix. Um, there's attempts to fix it. There's millions of dollars being thrown at fixing it. But I like the idea that some stuff can just be like a WordPress instance. Who gives a crap, right? It's not going to kill anybody. Th some things require and command higher. So if you look at that as stifling innovation, um, Anyone can make any project they want, but I believe as we start publishing hygiene statistics and security characteristics, people will gravitate towards higher assurance, higher quality ones where it matters. Yeah. Okay. Um, how do you evaluate open source libraries besides CVE? Oh, I had this really elaborate framework, and whoever asks this question, just find me. Um, we looked at a number of attributes, like number of committers, um, are they active committers, um, bug density per thousand lines of code, Fix rates, recidivism rates. So, how, when you fix something, how you know how how many tries does it take to get it right? Um, we would look at uh, declared license, observable license. We would look at adoption across the Fortune 100, Fortune 500, Fortune 5000. We would look at who has a corporate contributor. We had dozens of amazing attributes, and you could do a weighted average score. We were calling this notion project integrity. So when you have a project that has like an IBM putting payroll onto the project, the project's going to be OK. Even if it's not great hygiene, it's not going to be orphaned. We saw some of the most dependent upon projects on Earth had zero committers. They were dead projects. So even if you found a really, really bad thing, sure, someone could go fix it, but the projects were dead. Um, and I don't think we've been looking at these attributes, but those are just a few that you could leverage to decide which projects are strategic and which ones are not. OK, so before choosing a library, I should check how many commits they have. That's one, the, yeah. one yeah. indicator. Yeah. And, and those indicators are not equally important to everybody. Mm. But they're, they're observable. And they're you can even do visualizations on them, perhaps. But. OK, I, I think we can do maybe one or two oh. more questions. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, so regarding the verification of open source libraries, you mentioned all these different properties and attributes. Uh, is there a relatively simpler way to get them? Or because it, you said at IBM you had this project. And I didn't have that at IBM, but, but uh, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. So it's great, but it sounds like a lot of manpower and time yeah. to invest in something that larger companies can do, but smaller companies wouldn't right. be able to. Um, one of the reasons I default to CVE is it's not the, the determining factor, but it, it's an, an indicator of how much care goes into the project. Um, to me, the, the committers is pretty easy to see. The lines of code, uh, total lines of code, and the bug, bug rate and fix rate. You don't have to do all those, but those are pretty easy to glean. Um, in fact, I was encouraging my, you know, my former employee to start publishing these. Their fear was, it's a fair fear, their fear was if they publish people with really good hygiene, they would have the entire open source community hate them. Because most of us are doing really, really bad hygiene on our projects. But my attitude was slightly different. I said, what if we just publish the people above a certain quality level? And you give them a gold star. And we don't say who the bad ones are or how bad they are, but they're clearly not a gold star. So I would love an alternative description that won't get everyone to hate my former employer. Um, but I think once you define what good looks like, people might want to be better and want to be in that good class. And you might see market behavior change as well. So if you know that only two logging frameworks have a gold star, you might see a lot of drop off on the older, other ones and a lot of migration, including committers, to a better project. So I think we have just started deciding to play with this as a community. I mean, this might be the first time you've heard of these things. Um, but I think there's plenty of room for, for changing the public health issue to something more sustainable. Thank you. Yeah. One last question? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.